building back. The U.S. economy braces as the Inflation Reduction Act becomes law. We're at the White House. Truth and consequences. Analyzing key primary elections as prosecutions of former President Donald Trump intensify. Canceled class. Why a Catholic Supreme Court justice is no longer teaching at a prominent D.C. law school. And Marian devotion. How one celebration of the Blessed Mother's Assumption embraces three major faiths. On EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, August 16th, 2022. Thank you so much for being with us tonight on this feast of St. Stephen of Hungary. I'm Tracy Sable. President Joe Biden returned to the White House today, but the First Lady was not with him. She tested positive for COVID-19 and is experiencing mild symptoms. Meanwhile, the president signed a bill that spends billions of dollars and divides Democrats and Republicans. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, first, a little more on the First Lady. She's been on vacation with the president in South Carolina. Now she's taking Paxlovid, an antiviral drug, and is isolating. The president, President Biden, tested negative. And this afternoon, he put his signature on the much celebrated, but also much maligned, Inflation Reduction Act. At the White House, President Joe Biden signs the Inflation Reduction Act into law. The bill I'm about to sign is not just about today. It's about tomorrow. It's about delivering progress and prosperity to American families. President Biden also tweets, the Inflation Reduction Act will position America to meet my climate goals, saving families hundreds of dollars a year on energy costs. And for families that take advantage of clean energy and electric vehicle tax credits, they could see more than twice the savings. Also in the legislation, a $2,000 cap on out-of-pocket prescription drug costs for Medicare recipients. Brian Deese, the director of the National Economic Council, spoke to that. Reducing costs in Medicare is one of the ways that this bill actually reduces the federal deficit. Still with inflation raging near its highest level in four decades, gas prices at $3.94 a gallon, Americans are looking for help now. Another reason for skepticism, Republicans write, when you vote to raise taxes, hire 87,000 new IRS agents, and make inflation worse, voters rightly have questions. But the chairman of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on Domestic Justice and Human Development recently wrote, I am also grateful for provisions in the bill that will lower prescription drug costs for those who rely on Medicare and continue to call on lawmakers to ensure all health care policy respects the inherent dignity and right to life of every human being. And with the First Lady's COVID diagnosis, she'll have to miss her planned trip to Florida for later this week. She was supposed to honor injured troops participating in the Warrior Games at Disney World. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. While the Justice Department opposes publication of the sworn statement which prompted the FBI to search former President Donald Trump's Florida estate. The former president has called for unsealing the affidavit. Several news organizations have also filed requests to make it public, but the government wants a federal court to keep it sealed to protect the investigation and the identity of the witness. And coming up later in the newscast, analysis of the Mar-a-Lago search and the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act, as well as a look at today's primaries from Tom Bevan, co-founder of Real Clear Politics. The pro-life heartbeat law in Georgia will remain in effect. A state judge ruled yesterday that he does not have authority to block the law while a lawsuit by pro-abortion supporters works its way through the court. Our questions have been raised about safety codes and years of government-imposed restrictions on building churches in Egypt. It comes after more than 40 people died in a fire at a Coptic Orthodox church on Sunday blamed on electrical short circuit. Well, U.S. Catholic bishops are denouncing Lebanon's government, government that is, for detaining a Maronite Catholic prelate last month. A statement says Archbishop Musa al haja was returning from Israel with aid and finances, which authorities confiscated during a border inspection. Iran has submitted a written response to the European Union as part of ongoing negotiations to restore the 2015 nuclear deal. For the moment, we are studying it and we are consulting with the other GCPOA participants. 
The EU has been mediating talks concerning the agreement from which the U.S. withdrew in 2018. Iran's activity has not been monitored since it turned off surveillance cameras in June. Experts warn Iran has enriched enough uranium to make at least one nuclear bomb. The U.S. and South Korea are ready to begin large-scale military exercises. Ten days of drills will begin next Monday. They are billed as biggest combined military training in years. The exercises come as North Korea has increased its own weapons test and intensified its threats of nuclear conflict. Well, there is new uncertainty following presidential elections last week in Kenya. Deputy President William Ruto was declared the winner by a narrow margin. Today, his main challenger said that he will contest the result. The announcement raises fears that the outcome will not be known for several weeks. Church leaders are appealing for calm as the process plays out. Pope Francis has long said that he wants the church to be more transparent. To that end, the Vatican recently released two important financial statements. The first document is the Holy See's financial statement for 2021. It shows a deficit of more than $3 million. However, that is much less than the projected deficit of $34 million. The other report is for a section of the Vatican. It shows that despite difficulties from the pandemic, the department has a surplus of more than $8 million. Joining us now is Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Andreas, great to see you. Um, so what more can you tell us about this? And also, should we be concerned about the Holy See's finances? Well, if you want to have a short answer, Tracy, for the near future, we probably do not have to be concerned. The Vatican has released its financial numbers over the last weeks, and I had a little closer look. As News Nightly already reported for 2021, the Holy See's financial statement showed a deficit of around 3 million euros, and the Vatican Secretariat for the Economy was quick to put that number into better context. There were projections of a deficit amounting to 30 million euros or dollars. It turned out to be only a tenth of that. And against the balance sheet of several billions, three millions are not that much. Having said that, the Holy See is far from facing an easy time ahead, at least when it comes to finances. So it sounds like you're saying, you know, the deficit is actually not all that bad. Um, that being said, um, could there be financial trouble, you know, looming in the future, Andreas? Well, um, there could be financial trouble looming in the future, Tracy. And when we talk about the Vatican and money, we need to consider three things. First, we're still in the middle of the biggest financial trial Vatican officials ever had to face, including prominent defendants such as former Cardinal Becciu. Second, Pope Francis's new constitution, Predicate Evangelium, went to infect, into effect in June and brought a significant shift in the management of financial resources and real estate assets. And thirdly, the Curia, which is more or less the government of the church, is spending more than it brings in. According to the Secretariat for the Economy, over the last couple of years, assets have been sold in order to avoid too big of a deficit. Jesuit father Juan Antonio Guerrero Alves, the prefect of the secretariat, spoke of more than 20 million that are missing every year. On the Holy See's official channel, Vatican News, he said that the courier continues to show insufficient co coverage. And I quote, the Pope's mission, he said, is underfunded. A big liability that is looming over the Vatican finances is a pension fund of the courier. Father Guerrero was rather outspoken when he said that there are close to a billion euros, which at this moment would not be sustainable in the long term, a problem that will only increase if the Vatican will be looking to hire more lay people into the ranks of the Curia, who will have certain pension and health care requirements. And this is something the new constitution is certainly facilitating, if not even pushing. And Andreas, before I let you go, um, can you tell us more about the new structure of financial management uh, in the Vatican that you mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. So in the new constitution, a lot of responsibilities for finances and asset management has been accumulated with APSA. This is short for the administration of the patrimony of the Holy See. 
it has also published its financial statements just recently. And UPSA's president, Bishop Nuncio Galantino, said in a public statement that it was necessary for reasons of transparency to make the financials public, which has happened last year for the very first time. Credibility and reputation of the church, he said, also require competent and transparent management of the patrimony. The first big task APSA had to take on was the selling of the infamous London property, which we also reported on, which they did at the beginning of this summer, sadly at a rather big loss. But altogether, APSA was able to report a surplus of more than 8 million euros, and the operating result was close to 40 million euros, with around 20 million coming from the management of the Vatican's real estate assets. However, considering that the assets include Rome's prime locations, just as the Centro Storico and Via Consolazione, and that these assets amount to more than a billion euros, the returns are still far from average industry standards and will have to improve in the coming years. The same is true for investment returns. First steps into the right direction have been taken. A new investment board of very capable individuals with strong track records in the financial industry has been already established. So, Tracy, no need to be overtly concerned for the Vatican financials, but prayer will certainly be appreciated. All right, we're going to leave it right there. Andreas, thank you so much for that report. We really appreciate it. Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Thank you again. Coming up, political landscape. Previewing key elections as the Inflation Reduction Act becomes law. reported earlier, President Joe Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act into law this afternoon. However, many economists are skeptical that the law will actually help to bring down the record high inflation that Americans are facing. And joining us now to discuss is Tom Bevan, co-founder and president of Real Clear Politics. Tom, welcome back. Always great to see you. Uh, first off, your thoughts on the Inflation Reduction Act and how it will help or hurt the American people. Well, I think there's a lot to, we're going to have to find out. I mean, obviously, the Democrats are touting the investments that this is making in the environment. Uh, they are touting uh, the drug prescription drug uh, cost, lowering of prescription drugs and the like. And Republicans are pointing out that this is also going to be adding 80,000 IRS agents in the future and that the bill, as you mentioned, will do, a lot of economists say it will do actually nothing to, uh, to actually lower inflation. So I think there's a lot about this bill. Uh, that remains to be seen, whether it's going to be helpful or harmful to the American public as a political matter. It's a good day for Joe Biden. It shows that his, his government can actually do something, get something done. Democrats need something to take to voters uh, this fall with only 90 days until the election. And so they have something they can tout now, whether whether it ends up being a, a net positive uh, in the long run remains to be seen. Yeah, and one thing I want to get to, too, is also uh, the primaries. I know you have your eyes on that. And uh, Representative Liz Cheney, she's facing some fierce competition in her primary in Wyoming by uh, Trump-backed challenger Harriet Hegman. Um, how much, if at all, do you think Cheney's uh, distaste, we'll call it, uh, for the former president, including her voting to impeach him and heading up the January 6th committee, how much do you think it'll play into this primary? Oh, I mean, it's it's the entire ball game. I mean, she she won her last race by about forty points. She's probably going to lose today by about the same margin. And it, it, you know, obviously, Wyoming's a very red state. A lot of Trump supporters there. And Liz Cheney has made it her mission uh, to to, as she has openly said, to keep this president, uh, keep President Trump, former President Trump, away from the Oval Office. She's made it her personal mission. And so, as a result, she's been. Uh, you know, censured, uh, kicked out of the Republican Party in Wyoming, and uh, she is now on track to lose greatly. And, and we'll see what she does after that, if there's any, uh, you know, what she will do beyond uh, politics. But her political career is going to end today in Wyoming. Yeah, another uh, big race to watch is in Alaska. Uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski, who also voted to impeach uh, the former president. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more this pri about this primary, that is? I know it's being conducted uh, a little bit differently than in other states. Right, so Alaska is using ranked choice voting for the first time, which critics say, including Sarah Palin, who's on the ballot today, is confusing to voters uh, and going to create a mess. We'll find out. But basically, uh, Alaskans are going to go to the polls and they are going to rank the candidates in their choice uh, from first to through fourth or fifth or however many candidates are on the ballot. Uh, and those candidates will, will move on. Uh, the, unless someone wins 50 percent of the vote, uh, those candidates are going to move on to a general election where 
they're going to find out, you know, one candidate will be eliminated through each round of voting until one person is left that gets more than 50 percent. So Lisa Murkowski is going to easily clear that bar in this uh, in this vote, uh, as will her opponent, uh, Kelly Shibaka. She's she's backed by Donald Trump. So uh, we'll set up a, a real uh, showdown uh, in the fall. And we'll see what happens with the, with the House seat that Sarah Palin is running for. There are three candidates uh, in that race that, that will all get uh, a decent amount of votes. And we'll have to see uh, who ends up on the outside of that race. Yeah, Tom, another thing I want to talk about uh, on a different note here, uh, the Justice Department and Attorney General Merrick Garland uh, have faced backlash over the FBI raid of Mar-a-Lago, as you know, especially since the DOJ doesn't want to unseal the affidavit that shows uh, probable cause for this unprecedented action. Your reaction to that, and do you think that our institutions are becoming too politicized? Well, I do. My personal opinion is that they are, and it's, it continues to get worse. Uh, I think this decision by, the, by uh, Merrick Garland, uh, I mean, whether you agree with the fundamentals of it or not, there's no question that the way that they went about taking this step was going to undermine uh, the trust in this institution, given uh, that this is a, an unprecedented thing. It's never been done before, and, and here it's being done to former President Trump, who is already uh, seen by at least you know half the population to have been persecuted by by you know uh, elements within uh, the government, and so I think it's unfortunate. I think it will continue, and I do think that this requires uh, an unprecedented level of transparency, and that not only should uh, that as the um, the warrant was revealed, but but the affidavit needs to be released as well. The American people need to see exactly what went into this decision-making process. What Merrick Garland did the other day, his statement that he gave four minutes, uh, giving really no answers to this other than he personally approved this this raid, that's not good enough. And Tom, before I let you go, uh, what else are you following? Well, I mean, this is the biggest story, the one we just mentioned, and there's going to be a hearing tomorrow by a judge uh, as whether they will unseal this affidavit. I mean, the, the consequences of this uh, this raid at Mar-a-Lago will have huge implications, I think, for not only just 2022, but 2024. It is galvanizing voters uh, around President Trump, even those who, who probably didn't want him to run for president in 2024. And so um, as this story plays out, I'm going to be watching this very carefully and watching how it's moving public opinion, both in the short term for 2022 and in the longer term for 2024. Yeah, it really is a big story right now. Tom, it thanks is. so much for weighing in. Appreciate it, as always. Absolutely. Thank you. Up next, chilling effects. Why a Catholic Supreme Court justice isn't teaching his law school class. Plus, Marian devotion. A procession in an African city honors the Blessed Mother's heavenly intercession. Clarence Thomas will not be teaching at George Washington University Law School in Washington, D.C. this fall. The Catholic Supreme Court Justice really has been teaching at the law school since 2011 and was expected to co-teach a course on constitutional law. Although the university received calls to fire Justice Thomas following the overturning of Roe versus Wade, the school says its values, it values academic freedom and freedom of expression. And joining us now to discuss is Mark Paletta, co-author of Created Equal, Clarence Thomas in his own words. Mark, welcome back. So great to see you. Tracy, thanks for having me on. So let's talk a little bit more about this decision uh, by Justice Clarence Thomas not to teach the class. What went into that? Well, it's a real loss to the, to the George Washington Law School and to the students. It was a tremendously popular course. It was oversubscribed every year. Uh, to have a justice of the Supreme Court teaching on famous cases, and it's the facts and the backgrounds to those cases and the sort of the, the, the consequences of those decisions that the, what the course was about. And a lot of the students who wrote papers in that course, they went on to get those published in, in law review. So it's a real loss to the university. Why did Justice Thomas, I think, decide not to do it? I think it's the, the security safety issues uh, that the left has inflicted on the Supreme Court and conservative justices. And I think it's despicable. But the idea, this rumor or this notion that Justice Thomas was uh, sort of decided not to teach because of this, this uh, what I call sort of this, um, this uh, snowflake petition mm -hmm. uh, by students that don't want to have somebody on their campus uh, who has a different view on something is absolutely, it's uh, untrue. It didn't have anything to do with his uh, decision not to teach there. 
Um, but it's a real loss to the university. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as you mentioned, the conservative justices really, they did receive a lot of backlash because of Dobbs, in particular, Justice Thomas, even some racial slurs against him and his family. Um, can you talk more about that and also how he handled that and how his Catholic faith helped him to handle that as well? Sure. And when you say backlash, I mean, let's get be clear, it's, it was assassination attempts. I mean, this is unprecedented. This is what the left does. They want to destroy the Supreme Court. They want to go after these justices. And he, I think he looked at his faith. Uh, you know, as we know, uh, in the back of the book on Justice Thomas, mm -hmm. there's a litany of humility that he has hanging up in his chambers. Uh, and it says, you know, Jesus, you know, you know, keep me from wanting to be esteemed. Keep me from wanting to be respected. Keep me from the fear of being humiliated and, 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 um, and, and, and um, criticized. Mm -hmm. And so that's what drives Justice Thomas. So you know, these critics, the critics have been after Justice Thomas for 40 years. He's been on the Supreme Court for 30 years. What's astonishing to me or remarkable is how the court has moved in Justice Thomas's direction on almost every single issue over these 30 years. He was writing solo dissents. And now, from the Dobbs decision to the gun decision to uh, the EPA decision on reigning in the administrative state, those are all, you know, issues that Justice Thomas was writing on planting the seeds and the court has now followed in his in his direction. Yeah, and that's one thing I wanted to talk about. We, we weren't able to do it the last time you were on, but his jurisprudence and really what guides him in these decisions. Sure, it's, it's faithfulness to the Constitution. It's, it's originalism. It's looking at the text of the Constitution, not substituting his policy choices for what the Constitution commands. And like in Dobbs, it goes back to the states to decide what to do on abortion. And that is a humble justice. That is a justice who understands his role uh, on the Supreme Court and in our society. That's what makes it a, a great country, uh, that the people get to decide on, on issues that aren't spelled out on the Constitution. So, um, you know, he's going to be fine. It's just a loss for George Washington uh, to have a, a, one of our greatest justices in our history not teach at their school. And it's all led by, uh, you know, again, the, the petition had nothing to do with it, but it's the, the general violence of the left that's made it very difficult, I think, for certainly the conservative justices to move about and go out in public or at universities. And that's that's sad. It's sad. It is yeah. sad for sure. You know, one of the things I want to touch on before we run out of time, uh, there's a bill that was re recently that has introduced that would impose term li limits on the justices. Talk to us more about that. And what do you think that signals? Um, it's, it's the left trying to destroy the Supreme Court. There's been nine justices for over 100 years, uh, and you know it's um, you know and it's worked well because they're not getting their way. Mm -hmm. They want to tear apart the Supreme Court. That's what that's about. And this idea of I think it, Justice Thomas would be the first one, <laughs> of course, who would have to retire. It's not going to go anywhere. But I think it tells you more about the left and how they don't respect the Supreme Court, how they want it to give you give them the decisions they want as opposed to respecting an independent judiciary. So it's, it's, it's kind of a sad day that they're pushing for those types of solutions for Supreme Court that, in my view, had the greatest term in many, many years. Yeah, we have probably about 30 seconds left, Mark. Uh, wondering, though, you know, what can be done about all this? And any final thoughts about Justice Thomas? Justice Thomas is our greatest living American. He's our greatest justice. Um, you, you know, people should read the book, watch the movie on Justice Thomas, learn about Justice Thomas. He doesn't, you know, he, he's the most engaging person, even to the students at that school. They love to debate with Justice Thomas and talk to Justice Thomas. So people should get to know Justice Thomas and the other justices, but in particular, Justice Thomas. He's our longest serving justice, and he's had a most remarkable rise, you know, growing up in state sanctioned segregation to reach the Supreme Court. It's a remarkable American story. More Americans should know about it. Absolutely. And every time we see him, he has a smile on his face. Yes. Such a joyful person. Mark, thank you so much for being on. We always appreciate it. Thanks, Tracy. Thank Thanks you. for having me on. And finally tonight, a Marian devotion is celebrated in the Little Sicily section of Tunisia's capital. A procession of the statue of Our Lady of Trapani in Tunis brings together Christians, Jews, and Muslims in the annual celebration of Mary's Assumption into Heaven. The original statue dates back from the 14th century. It honors the prayer of a Christian knight whose life was spared from a shipwreck. Oh, we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.